the first reading today, we heard one of the most important readings of the Old Testament. There are lots of things, obviously, and the entire Bible is the Word of God, and yet there are some things that stand out because of their absolute importance. This one is the promise that God made through the prophet Jeremiah that there was going to be a new covenant. The Jewish people, remember, had the covenant that they had made. They had the covenant with Abraham and then the covenant that God made with Noah. But this was made a thousand years. This, this reading was a thousand years after the covenant with Abraham. It was a thousand years after the covenant that was made with Moses. It was only about 500 years before Jesus came into this world. So yes, it is ancient, but not nearly as ancient as some of the things. And the importance again, of putting it into that context is to realize this wasn't talking about a covenant that God was gonna make with Moses because that was made a long time before. And so this is the new covenant that he's talking about. And what is critically important about this new covenant is that the Lord himself says it will not be like the old covenant that I made with the people. And so what was the covenant with the old, with the old covenant? It was written on stone. It was something that was external to the people. This one, God says, is going to be written in the hearts of the people, written on flesh, if you will, interior to us, not external to us. And so he said, I will write my law upon their, upon their hearts. That is exactly what he has done for each and every one of us. And so we have to look a little bit more carefully then at this to be able to ask, first of all, why does the church give us this reading right now? It's Passion Sunday. So we have now two weeks until Easter, and we begin Passion Tide now. As you can see, all the statues and everything covered up. All of those are covered up because they're too big to carry out. So that's why they're covered up, literally. So it used to be that they would just take everything out of the church that was beautiful because we just need to focus in. We need to zero in on what's going to be happening here in these next two weeks. When the statues got too heavy and so on, they said, well, just cover them up instead of taking them out. But the focus still needs to remain the same. We aren't going to be as easily distracted by all the beautiful things that are there, even though those things raise, us, raise our minds and thoughts up to heaven. Nonetheless, it's just focusing now on what Jesus is doing. And so the church gives us this reading because this is what Jesus is going to be doing. If you really think about what we hear at every single Mass, in the consecration of the chalice, we talk about the new and everlasting covenant. The new covenant. That's what you were baptized into. And so that covenant is yours. You are a member of it, which is why this is so critical to understand because again, it's who we are. So while indeed that covenant was initially set out sacramentally at the Last Supper, it's only on the cross that that covenant is ratified because the covenants are sealed in blood, and in this case, the blood of our blessed Lord. That's why we have that second reading, the church talking to us about the suffering of Christ, how when he was in the, the, the flesh that he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears and so on, and we hear about his obedience and the suffering and being made perfect, but it's not just that all that happened for him because as he himself said in the gospel reading, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a single grain. If it dies, it produces much fruit. 
So what does St. Paul say that happened with Jesus? When he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And so it's not just for him, it's for us. And we even see that in the gospel reading today. Maybe it's not quite as obvious to us, but we have to see the context of it. We have these Greek people coming to, well, to Philip and Andrew. They they come to Jerusalem because they want to celebrate the Passover. They come to Philip and Andrew. Again, this is one of those things that most of us couldn't care less about, but you have to understand, why did they come to Philip and Andrew? The 12 apostles, those are the two that had Greek names. These were Greeks. So Philip and Andrew are Greek names. So they said, oh, well, these guys we'd be able to talk to. They come to Jesus and say, okay, look, there are some people who want to see you. And what does Jesus say? The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It's like, what kind of answer is that? Well, ask yourself, what is the covenant? When St. Paul talked about the mystery that was hidden from ages past but is now revealed to us, that mystery, he says, is that the Gentiles are now co-heirs with the Jews and members of the same covenant. So the Gentiles come to Jesus. He came, as he told us, as he, well, as he told the Canaanite woman, he came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was his initial mission. And now it's the Gentiles who are coming to him, which is why now he can say, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Because now the Jewish people, not all of them obviously, but Jewish people were believing in him, and now the Gentiles were believing in him. So as these Gentiles come of their own accord to be able to say, we want to see Jesus, now that covenant can finally be established. And that's exactly what we hear, not only as he talks about the fact of the grain of wheat falling to the ground, but then we go down a little bit further. He talks about the ruler of this world being kicked out, which is Satan, And then he said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw people to myself. There is where the covenant was ratified. That is what we have to be drawn to. In other words, if you were living a couple of thousand years ago before our Lord came, and you were going to be part of the covenant that God had made through through Moses, you'd be drawn essentially back to Mount Sinai. You'd be drawn to all of the things of the Passover. Now we have a new covenant, and we have to be drawn to the covenant. And this is the most wonderful part of it, and you'll see this even as you follow the readings in the next couple of weeks, because there are four passages from the book of the prophet Isaiah that are known as the Suffering Servant Songs. They come from Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and then 52 and 53. The one 52 and 53 is the one that's the best known, but for our purposes, we have to look at the first two. And you'll hear them at Mass in the next couple of weeks because it talks about the fact that God is going to make a covenant. But it's not just that he's going to make a covenant, because he tells us what the covenant is. And really the word what isn't correct, it's who. Because these are messianic passages. So these are written by the prophet Isaiah. So this is about 700 years before our Lord came into the world. And he's writing about the Messiah and the suffering that the Messiah is going to endure. And God says in both 42 and 49, it's not enough for you to do all these things. He said, I will make of you a covenant to the people. 
I will make you a covenant. Notice he doesn't say, I will make a covenant with you. God made a covenant with Adam. God made a covenant with Noah. God made a covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant with Moses. God didn't make a covenant with Jesus. Jesus is the covenant. So once again, when you recognize this, the importance of what we heard in the first reading, that God is not going to write this on stone, but on human hearts. It is a covenant of love. And it's written within us. And so when we are baptized, we become members of the covenant, participants in the covenant, but we become members of Jesus Christ at our baptism because he's the covenant. So that's why all of this is given to us now, because in the next couple of weeks, this is what we're going to be celebrating. It's not, again, just something that happened 2,000 years ago. Yes, physically to Jesus, it happened 2,000 years ago. But this is happening right now, inside of you and me. So remember when the Jewish people celebrate Passover, they're not saying, oh, 3,500 years ago, our ancestors left Egypt. No, God told them if they're going to celebrate the Passover, they have to be dressed as they are, as if they are people on, on, that are in flight. They have to have their shoes on, they've got to have their, their, their belts on, they've got to be ready to go because they are celebrating the Passover. Not just remembering an event that happened a long time ago, living it. It's happening still. So when Jesus told us, do this in remembrance of me, that's what it means. Not, oh yeah, remember 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross, don't forget that. No, that's not what it means. It means make it real, continue. That's the Jewish notion of, of memorial. And so when he talks about the remembrance, that's what he's doing. So it's what's already there within us, and he's asking us to live it. And the wonderful thing is that unlike the Jewish people who do this once a year at their Passover, we have it every day. Certainly every single Sunday, because every Sunday is a little Easter. But we celebrate this every day because it is alive in you and me. So that's what we have to really look at now as we go through these next two weeks. Am I really taking this in? Or am I keeping this at an arm's distance? Am I really striving to live this because this is who I am? Or do I just look at it as, yeah, that's what they did to Jesus 2,000 years ago? If it's all that they did to Jesus 2,000 years ago, then I can only ask you, how has he become the source of eternal salvation for you today, 2,000 years later? You see, it can't just be an event that happened 2,000 years ago. If it's affecting you today, then it still has to be happening today. And it is. It's happening on the altar, but it's happening inside of you and me. It's written in our hearts. We're baptized into this so that we can live it. That's why St. Paul says when we're baptized, we're baptized into the death and to the resurrection of our Lord because that's where this covenant is established. So I encourage you strongly to take part in the liturgies of Holy Week. They're profound, they're beautiful, 
but only if we have it in our hearts. If we're just going through the motions, yeah, we're going to go, yeah, that was nice, big deal. But if we're uniting ourselves with Jesus, if we're going through this with Jesus because it's happening still, it's not happening again, just like what happens at Mass, we're not crucifying Jesus or sacrificing him again, but still, it's one sacrifice for all time. And so it is one sacrifice that is being perpetuated throughout history. And now, that same covenant that we celebrate at Mass is being perpetuated in you and me. And we are able to receive our blessed Lord. We're able to celebrate these things over and over so that we can be drawn deeper and deeper. So once again, listen to what our Lord said. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Once again, that happened 2,000 years ago. He was on the cross for several hours, then he was taken down, put in a tomb, and now he's in heaven. So if that happened 2,000 years ago, and it was when he was lifted up from the earth that he would draw us to himself, how can we be drawn to him if it's supposed to be on the cross? Only if it's still happening. Because there's no way you and I can be drawn to somebody who isn't on the cross anymore because he was there 2,000 years ago. So it's an ongoing reality. We also have to remember Jesus was lifted up two other times from the earth. It's on the cross, it's in the resurrection, and it's in the ascension. So we're drawn to him because that's where he's establishing the covenant. In the resurrection, that's where he is demonstrated to be the Christ. In the ascension into heaven, that is the glorification. That's why St. Paul tells us that we are already seated at the right hand of God in Jesus because we're members of Christ. So take these things to prayer. These are, these are not easy concepts. These are profound. These are deep. These are the things that God has written in our heart. So it's already there. This is, shouldn't come as a shock to any of us. But maybe there are some new insights and all that I'm doing here is skimming the surface because there's not time. So go through the readings, look at what's said. Look at, again, don't take my word for it, go back, look at Isaiah 42, look at Isaiah 49, look exactly what it says. Read Isaiah 52 and 53 and see what it says. Then read the Gospels, read the Passion, all these things, look at what's going on. And then look at beyond, you can look at what the saints have taught us what St. Paul had to say, and so on, as they look back at what Jesus had done and at what he continues to do. Because that's the part we have to remember. We're not just here going through the motions of remembering an event of 2,000 years ago. We are here to continue and to celebrate that event because it is continuing in the sacrifice of the Mass. It is continuing in the hearts of each and every person who is baptized into the covenant. And the covenant is a person, the person of Jesus Christ, living and within us, and we within him. Profound and beautiful things now we just have to open our hearts to receive it, to let it in. It's already there because it's who we are. But don't keep it at an arm's distance. Let it in. And really take these things to prayer over these next couple of weeks and watch what God will do if you're willing to open your heart and let him begin to transform your life to be conformed to Jesus Christ in his crucifixion but also in his resurrection and in his glorification, because now is the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified, glorified on the cross, glorified also 
in eternity.